Hello and welcome to my studio. I'm going to show you how to paint this gorgeous um, painting with palette knives of Monet's beautiful home at Givernay, France. These are the palette knives I'm using and I'm introducing you to two new colors, Burnt Carmine and Quinacridone Purple Bluish. They're great colors. These are Cobra solvent free oil paints. That's burnt carmine and that's quinacridone purple bluish. <laughs> so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about my intention for this painting. It's really important when you start a painting to think about how you want it to look. Looking at your reference photo, you want to start with uh, what inspired you to choose that reference photo and there could be many many sources of inspiration but you want to think about what it is you want to capture and the feeling that you want your viewer to get when they look at your painting and I'm going to keep talking to you about that but just so you know right now I'm blocking in big shapes with permanent green and little bits of red added to it so at some um, on some of the mixtures I'm using uh, quinacridone rose and in some of the mixtures I'm using pyro red and so on but um, no titanium white blocking in the big shapes I just want to block in big shapes of deep rich green where I see areas that need green and and so on and by the way I apologize in advance for the glare on the right side I'll keep moving my light around to avoid the glare but one of the things with painting with palette knives is that the paint is thick and Sometimes it's reflective, so I apologize for that, but um, it will get better later in the video. Okay, so back to intention. So you might want your painting to feel calm. You might want it to feel inviting. You might want it to feel like a warm, sunny day, or you might want to capture a storm and the mood of a of brooding weather or something like that. So you might want to think that you want your work to be funny or silly or make somebody smile when they look at it. But whatever your intention is, you want to think about what tools do you have to translate into making a painting that says all those things. So color is a tool, lines are a, cool, a tool, values are a tool, edge work is a tool. And so we're going to be using those throughout this um, painting demonstration. And my intention for this painting is to create a beautiful, inviting painting that's loosely painted and has the viewer feeling like they just look at it and smile and want to walk down the path and smell the beautiful flowers. And I want it to be bright and colorful. I also want my paintings to look contemporary. So Part of that I'll explain in my color palette, but I want my work to look impressionistic because I love impressionism and it's just a part of how I paint. But I also want my work to look contemporary. I don't want it to look old fashioned or traditional in any way. And so one of the steps I took in creating my palette is I eliminated any earth colors and I don't have any browns. So I stopped using umber, burnt umber, raw umber, um, Van Dyke Brown, um, Burnt Sienna. I use, actually, I use Burnt Sienna sometimes, but that's really the only brown and earth color that I use. I sometimes use raw sienna as well, but never yellow ochre. Um, although I do have some old tubes of yellow ochre, and maybe someday I'll, I'll find a use for them. But I find that brown colors make my painting look uh, old fashioned, and they can also very easily create mud. And since I paint uh, with a lot of greens and blues, having darks that are not brownish darks uh, helps my painting look more contemporary. So I typically use darks that are violet and I use um, different mixtures of paint to create these violets. So this color burnt carmine that I've um, put on my palette today, the one in the upper left next to Persian Rose, is very similar to Kaput Mortem Violet, which is a paint that you can get in traditional Rembrandt paints, but not in Cobra Solvent Free oil paints. So I really like it. Um, Kaput Mortem Violet is a strange name for a paint, but it's a really great color. 
um, to use in traditional oil paints. It's, um, it's kind of an earthy violet, and I say I steer away from earth colors, but in the case of making darks, it's a really good uh, violet to have. So why, why violet darks? Well, I like the look of greens. When the green, when a stroke of green paint is pulled through a stroke of deep violet, you get these beautiful edges and it just makes the green look more natural. So that allows me to use really, really bright, contemporary looking greens like permanent green deep or yellowish green and mix bright yellows into them like cadmium yellow medium, which is what I have on my palette today, or cadmium lemon. And those colors, which are super bright and garish, look natural when they have edges of violet through them. So you should try some of these mixtures yourself and see if you get the same result. But that's what I'll be painting today. And you can see what you think in my demonstration. This demonstration painting took me two hours to paint, but the video is just under an hour because there were a few times when I had to step away and look at my work from a distance just to see if I needed to make any adjustments. Um, and I advise you to always do that, whether you're sitting and painting, um, whether you're outside or in your studio, just always take a moment um, throughout the painting process to step back. A good time to do that is if you've mixed up some paint and you've used it all up and now you're ready to mix another pile of paint before you make that next mixture, just take a minute to step back and see what you think. I edited out some of my color mixing and um, the times when I stepped away, of course, so you wouldn't have to sit through a two hour video and, and be bored, but I left in all the good parts. So, um, the color that I'm using right now for blocking in these shutters is permanent green deep and turquoise. I typically mix um, colors that don't have any titanium white in them for the big shapes of green, but for the path, I mixed a neutral shade of um, a nice, it's like a nice neutral beige with a hint of pink in it. One of the things I noticed in the reference photo is that the, the color of the path has a lot of pink in it. If you look closely at it, it's a sort of pinkish beige, and it's almost the same as the color of the pink on the house. And I, I wanted to make sure that those two elements separated, and I wanted my path to be warm and inviting. And remember, I want it to feel like the viewer can look at the path and decide, oh, I'd like to walk down that path and smell the flowers, and it's very warm and inviting. So I made the path purposefully more golden, and um, I used... Pyro red, cadmium orange, cadmium yellow, a little Persian rose, and titanium white to get this mixture. You could easily make it using raw sienna or yellow ochre and white. And then to gray that slightly, you could add a little bit of blue, like ultramarine blue or cobalt, and a little bit of red, like quinacridone rose or matter lake or something like that. I like to introduce you to new colors, but I also like to definitely explain other color mixture options as I understand a lot of you won't have these colors but now you know about them so that's a good thing. A little bit about edge work. So I'm painting light and shadow on the path now. I added titanium white to the same color mixture that I used for the path and I painted some strokes of sunshine cast across the path and I blended them into the mixture underneath a little bit so I did a little wet on wet blending with my palette knife and now I mixed a color for the shadow, which is a nice cool gray violet, but about edges. So shadow edges are always soft edges. So that means you wanna push the knife into the wet paint a little bit and you wanna do a little blending. This is very different from a knife stroke where you want to pull the wet paint across the wet paint in a very light way so you get a clean, sharp edge. Shadow edges are soft, especially when they're cast by plants and trees and things like that and the, the surface of the path is textured, which would also be a soft edge for a shadow falling across a textured surface. If the lines, the horizontal lines were really sharp and harsh, it would feel uninviting. And again, my goal is always to use the tools that I have, color, edges, lines, and values, and so on, and create a really inviting path. 
Another note about this path is if you look at the reference photo, you can barely make out the shadows. They're really, really soft. But I wanted to create this warm, inviting painting. So that means I need to emphasize the light and shadow and make it look like the day is sunnier than it really is. So that means I need to make a bigger value separation between my light and shadow colors than what I can see in the reference photo. I'm using this beautiful greenish yellow color to block in some of the vines that are crawling across the, the face of the house. I'm pushing the paint into the little crevices of white in the canvas. I really want to get the whole surface covered with these big shapes. And I'm going right over my drawing, of course. I don't care. I know it's there. And I want my painting to be loose, and so I'm not being too careful with my edges. Even these straight edges are going to get wiggly wobbly pretty soon, and I'm going to be bringing leaves and branches and things like that over them. But I'm just establishing where everything is. So notice how similar this color is to the neutral color that I first put down on the path. This is more of a salmony pink though. I wanted this color to be more pink and the color on the path to be more golden. So I made the same color mixture and I added quinacridone rose to it to make it more pink. When you put down the first colors and you want to just fill in the, the canvas, don't worry too much about your edges being perfect. You're sort of making a road map for yourself and you're putting down layers of color that will help you create interesting textures of paint when you start blending on top of those. You're also creating spaces and shapes to start to get that initial feeling that you wanna have in your painting. It's really important when you begin any work of art, whether you're using palette knives or brushes, to keep your edges really soft, to keep color soft. This even applies to gouache and watercolor. You wanna start with soft edges because you don't want your eye to get stuck anywhere on the painting. Right now, at this stage in my painting, if I were to close my eyes and open my eyes, I would get stuck in that little spot to the right of the pink door where the white canvas is showing next to the dark green. Your eye will naturally gravitate towards any space in the canvas where there's a light light and a dark dark next to each other. So to fix that, you want to either make a, a color that's in, in the value range that's between the two, or you want to just use the side of your knife to blend those two things together, those two colors together, and eliminate that, that space. So now I've mixed up ultramarine blue and a tiny amount of titanium white, and I'm going to start right away putting the bright, colorful iris flowers onto the painting. Why not start with the green stems first and the green leaves? Because I'm going to be going back and forth a lot. As I said, I want to have a loose, colorful painting. Some people think of loose paintings as being paintings that um, have less paint on them with bigger strokes, but I think of loose paintings as being paintings that have lots of layers, multiple layers of paint where the artist has gone back and forth between the middle ground and the foreground and between the background and the middle ground. So I'm putting down the flowers first and then I'm going to come back over them with some of the iris leaves and then I'm going to come back with more bright colors for the flowers. And this is this is what it is anyway. When we look down the path, we see some of the flowers in the front and we see some behind them and their leaves and things growing up in between and so on. So we're going to be mimicking what nature is already showing us in the way that we're painting it. So I'm going to be layering lighter colors of blue over darker colors of blue, and then I'm going to mix up some nice violets. By the way, the pink door is actually going to become more of a violet gray, but I put the pink color down at first because I'm going to be mixing the violet gray in relation to the flowers in the foreground, and I wanted the flower color to be established first before I put the gray down for the door. And I want to make sure that the gray in the door is much more gray than the bright colors of the flowers in the front, in the foreground. This is so that the colors in the flowers come forward. 
So remember that in the foreground, bright colors are what you need. And you can even have colors that are right out of the tube. But in the middle ground, and in the case of this painting, the middle ground is the house, the colors can be softer and grayer. And we don't really have a background in this painting. Um, it's mostly foreground and middle ground, but you can think of the background as being all of the edges. So if you drew a big oval within this rectangular shape, the top right and left hand corners would be the edges that would sort of take the place of the background and would, would have grayer colors, softer edges, um, lighter values, and so on. They would have all of the elements that you would have in a background, since you don't really have a background on this painting. But a background is usually in place to support the middle ground. And so the upper right and left hand corners of this painting support the middle ground and also help keep the viewer in the foreground. But you don't want your middle ground to be so gray that the viewer doesn't want to leave the foreground and go there. You want it to be inviting and you want it to be a little mysterious color wise so that the viewer is attracted to all the bright colors in the foreground, attracted to your painting, and then in this case wants to take a walk down the path to see what's in the middle ground. So in essence, you want to have the colors in the middle ground just slightly gray enough that they're still colorful, that they're still inviting, but that slight grayness will also give your painting the depth that it needs. And your painting will always need depth to look three-dimensional. Color is the best tool for this, and you can use it to create depth. You'd also want those colors to be slightly lighter. But notice how I'm using really, really bright colors. And there's no mud in my painting. There's no brown. And you think of, of nature as, you know, of course there's dirt in nature and brown seems like a very natural color to incorporate in landscapes. But having violet darks is a much better option. If you want to eliminate brown from your palette altogether, you can always mix your own browns by mixing a red or an orange, um, not a cool red, but like a, like a, pyrrole red or a cadmium red light or a cadmium scarlet, something like that. So a warm, warmish red and orange and, um, and then some ultramarine blue or cobalt blue. And if you mix those together, so you have a, a yellow and an orangish red and a blue, you'll have a beautiful brown. Now I'm going to use some burnt carmine along the path. I just want to start to create that shadow edge of the greenery growing along the path. Let's talk a little bit about lines. So this path is a little bit of a railroad track design. Notice I did not center it too much. It's a little bit centered, but it's slightly to the right. But I'm going to be using the foliage later on um, to cover lots of the lines on the side of the, of the path. This is why it was important for me to establish the light and shadow patterns on the path because that allows me to be able to go back over those patterns with greenery, with purple flowers, and so on. And I don't have to worry about getting green pulled into the shadow colors or the sunlight colors onto the path. So it is good to do that first just so you have nice clean edges and you don't end up creating little tiny messes on your canvas that you have to go back and clean up something that I, I hate to do. I think one of the benefits of painting in both oil and watercolor is that when you paint in watercolor you have to think ahead a little bit and getting into the habit of thinking ahead and planning especially around things like edges like I just explained with that path um, it saves you a lot of time in painting and it does make you paint in oils faster and better and cleaner and in a more contemporary way. So painting in watercolors is a great tool and a great skill for you to develop that will help you with your oil paintings. Even if you don't even really like your watercolors, you'll be surprised at how much it can really help you with your oil painting. So now I'm using a green that's quite a few value shades lighter than the dark violet green underneath. 
and I'm getting beautiful edges when I pull the knife up through that dark violet paint. It's still bright, but the edges of those green strokes have just a little bit of that violet pulled into them, and so they have this beautiful natural looking edge. I'm using a fairly short round tip knife to make these long strokes of paint. The reason I'm using this short knife is because a long knife would be too difficult to use for me. Um, I don't have the dexterity to use a really big knife um, to make small strokes like this. And they do make long skinny palette knives, but I feel like I have more control with a shorter knife. But the secret to making these bright strokes of paint on top of the darker wet paint is to have lots and lots of thick paint on the back of your knife and to pull it across the paint underneath in a, with a very light touch. And if you do this, you won't pick up too much of the wet paint underneath and you'll get nice, bright, clean strokes of color. And you can build your layers from dark to light. Now I've mixed up a nice yellowish green with some cadmium yellow added to the same green mixture. And I just want to emphasize some of that warm sunlight hitting the side of the house and hitting the greenery up along the side of the house. Now I've mixed a nice orangey, yellowy green color and I want to start adding some of that color to the foliage that's above the, the green railing that goes across the middle of the house. I purposefully eliminated that long railing because it sort of divides my canvas and I didn't think it was very attractive and I didn't see that it was necessary to include. So I very often do that. I just eliminate things I don't like or I don't think are necessary to the painting. Having it there gives the painting a little more structure, but it also would create a line that would go across the top third of my canvas, which wouldn't be helpful to my composition because I want my composition to be very loose and more about nature rather than about the structure of what's there. In fact, you'll see at the end of the painting I cover more and more of the house with the foliage. I like that sort of overgrown cottage look and so I don't mind covering up a lot of the structure. I think the painting still has a lot of structure and also having tall flowers like irises in the foreground also help to give it structure. They give structure to the whole composition not just the house. Now I'm going to continue to add warm greens where I see the sunlight hitting the leaves that are right in front of the shadowy areas. So I'm using permanent green deep, sometimes a little bit of turquoise, sometimes a little bit of burnt carmine to gray it down a little bit, and then cadmium yellow and cadmium orange and I'm keeping my edges very soft. Remember I said the top right and left hand corners are sort of like the background in my painting, so I'm doing more blending there. But I'm still not ending up with mud because I'm using darks that are in the violet range and I'm keeping my edges soft. And even with the, add, the added yellows and oranges, I'm still not making mud, I'm not making brown colors. But my painting still looks natural in spite of all of these really bright colors that I've used, including yellowish green right out of the tube. So I'm going to continue on now for a little while, mixing shade after shade of green and layering paint in small strokes on the foliage on the front of the house. You can't have too many shades of green in a landscape painting. Greens are the hardest color family to master and so that makes landscape painting especially challenging. I'm going to add some of that blue gray on the door. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to make sure that it would be a grayer blue than the gray on the flowers and I wanted to have the flower blue established first before I added the gray to the door so that I could see how it was sitting back to see it and, and see if I need to add any more yellow to it or red or blue to make it a certain shade that would make it sit back from the flowers. I'm going to also sharpen the edges and add some shadowing around the door frame. Whenever you do this in a painting that you want to be loose with, you put down the dark first with the intention of coming back later and softening the edges where needed. 
The decision to soften dark edges and accents like what I've just put down has to be that you just want to make sure that you're not creating a space in your painting where the viewer's eye is going to get stuck. So your dark edges or your dark spots have to have soft edges and you have to be especially conscious of that. I'm going to mix a color now for the green um, window frames inside this door. I made them a little bit yellower than the color I made for the shade. This is because I don't want them to be too bright. And even though they're structured lines, I want them to have um, still like a, a loose quality to them. By the way, I'm using a number two round silver brush, bristlon brush to make these lines. Most of the time when I do a palette knife painting, if it has any detail at all, at some point I use a brush and I usually use that number two bristlon brush. That's usually the one I use. I also have the cat's tongue and I have triangle brushes. Triangle brushes are great to use with palette knife paintings because they make very loose marks. But I felt like for this door, I need to have a little more of a, a stiff brush and this number two is just the right amount of stiffness and point. So my lines are slightly wobbly, but that's fine because this is gonna be a loose painting. When I paint window panes, I always paint what's behind the window first, and then I paint the window panes over the over what's behind them. It would be too hard to try to paint the little spaces in between the window panes and make all those edges work. So it's much better to paint the, the wooden window panes on top of what's behind it first. Now I'm sharpening the edges of the door again. Back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> and then blending of course. If I make this door, which is in the middle ground, not in the foreground, if I make it too defined and too perfect and too structured, then it's going to take the viewer's attention away from the flowers. It's almost like me saying with my paint that, hey, this door is more important than the flowers, which is contradictory to my intention, right? My intention is to make to make this painting all about the nature and the flowers. But the nature and the flowers need just the, the slightest hint of structure to make them seem more natural. But I can't have that structure be too strong that it takes away from the natural beauty of the flowers and plants. I don't know if this makes sense. But in other words, if my door lines are too straight, like right now, look at the door on the left side, that straight line takes all my attention away from the flowers. I can hardly look at the flowers because I keep focusing on that door. So that means I'm gonna to have to come back and soften the edge of that line. And there are a lot of ways that I could do it. I could bring foliage across and intersect those tall vertical lines, or I could just soften the value or soften the edge. There are a lot of ways that I can soften or detract from the straightness of that door that's so distracting. But always keeping in mind, What's my initial intention for this painting? I'm using the back of my knife instead of a brush to create the little um, dark spots in the shutters. This is just a style thing. I just happen to like how that looks better, but when I do the vertical lines, I need my brush. And I'm using the same color. And this is a mixture of burnt carmine and ultramarine blue. I also like the look of using a palette knife for the shutters because it's impossible to make every one of the marks perfect. It's impossible to make them even and straight and I don't want them to be even and straight. I want my approach to edges and shape making and paint strokes to be consistent throughout the painting. Now I've mixed some titanium white in with the same color that I was using to make the darks and I'm making some brighter lines to give some dimension to my shutters. They have lights and darks and they're places where they're catching the light. I purposefully made the light color more of a turquoise because I want it to stand out from the light color foliage. So where the foliage is catching the sunlight, it's a yellowy green, but where the shutters are catching the sunlight, it's a bluish green. 
So always remember when you have two colors that are next to each other and they're the same color, so two colors of green for instance, you want to make sure that they separate and the, they'll separate in color when one is going in one direction on the color wheel, for instance the greenish yellow is going towards yellow and one going in the other direction which would be towards blue. So I've got a bluish green next to a yellowish green. They're both saying the same thing. They're both saying they are the light and that's where the sunlight is hitting them, but they're opposite, uh, they're going in opposite directions on the color wheel, so they'll separate visually. If the shutters were a yellow green, the only thing that would separate them would be the lines. The vertical and horizontal lines wouldn't say foliage visually, but they would look so close together that it would be hard to understand visually. And these are the things you can do as an artist. You look at your reference photo and you make all these changes because you want to make your painting work. It's all about making your painting work. It's not about making a portrait of your reference photo. And the feelings and things that you put into it, you have to think about that ahead of time and plan how you're going to put those into your painting. Jumping to orange now, I'm picking up straight cadmium orange and I'm putting it into little spaces in between the blues and violets and the greens. And the orange also goes really nicely with the deep violet green edges. It's just enough to tone it down because cadmium orange is a super bright color. It's one of the brightest colors that you can buy. And right out of the tube, it's, it's just amazingly bright, but so are those orange flowers. Sometimes when I look at what paints are available to us in comparison with what's available in nature, it amazes me at how bright and gorgeous the colors of flowers and things are in nature. And we have to mimic those with paint. And very often my students are afraid to use bright colors. They really shy away from them. They think that it's going to be too garish or it's going to look like um, a child's painting. But actually we need these colors, but we also need to ground those colors in lots of hues of green if they're flowers and you want your painting to still look natural, but you get that balance of really bright colors against natural looking colors. And that's how you create a beautiful floral painting. And this painting is a landscape, but it's also a floral because it's mostly about the flowers and the path, the garden path. So I've put the pink tulips up against the house and it's pink on pink. So I didn't mention it before, but that was another reason I chose that salmon color for the front of the house and made it pinkish. And it's still very close to the color of the path, but just pink enough that it looks different. And the pink flowers are a darker bright pink. I used quinacridone rose and titanium white, and then I used a little bit of Persian rose to give them a highlight. And I even mixed some titanium white with the Persian rose to emphasize the light highlight, but I definitely wanted them to have a light and shadow, even though they're really tiny, but look what a difference it makes. So I'm going to add some more green highlights to the building. Still lots of layering to do, believe it or not. I'm going to add some bluish green highlights also to some of the iris stems. They're wonderful shades of bluish green and yellowish green among the iris stems. But I'm getting lighter and lighter. Overall, my painting is, except for the path, my painting is still a little bit dark. So I feel like I really need to lighten a lot of the different areas of the painting. And I don't want it to be too yellow. I often find my students, when they decide that their painting is too dark or too mid-tone, they decide that they want to lighten it, but they always go for yellowy lights, but sometimes you need to go for bluish green lights. So really take your time when you're mixing colors and think. Think about what your painting needs and then mix those colors. I'm continuing on with my yellowy highlights for the foliage on the house. Notice how I'm moving my brush, I'm putting, or not my brush, excuse me, my palette knife I'm moving it um, from side to side a little bit instead of pulling it straight. 
I'm sort of wiggling it from side to side so some of my marks are a little scooped. You also want to be careful when you're adding your lights that you don't cover up all of your darks and that in between some of your light shapes are darker or medium tone shapes. You need the darks and the lights and everything in between. So as you work towards finishing your painting, make sure you work more slowly. It's okay to start fast and get those big shapes put down fast, but when you're working on finishing your painting, really work slowly. Make yourself slow down, make yourself take more breaks, and you'll have a better end result, and you won't get lost, and you won't feel like, oh, I need to scrape this off. You'll just sort of proceed through slowly and at your own pace. So I'm working on brightening the light white, the whitish blue flowers, iris flowers on the right, but they look a little too cool. So in a little while, I'm going to add some titanium white mixed with yellow and add some warm highlights as well. But right now I want to continue on adding the bluish white where I see it. So now my painting is very light and it's getting lighter and lighter and I still have a lot of midtones and now I'm starting to miss my darks but I am going to come back in later with some darker accents along the path and also around the door frame and this is how I paint I go back and forth a little bit and I'm always thinking about lines colors values temperatures shapes and so on so I just put down a stroke of the titanium white with the cadmium yellow mixed in and look what a difference it makes. It's just like, oh, there's the sunshine. There's the sunshine on the white flowers. And it doesn't make them look like they aren't blue flowers, but that little bit of warmth just makes a huge difference. And that's what I want, a bright sunny path with bright flowers in the foreground, capturing the attention of the viewer, making them wanna walk down the path and smell the flowers. So I'm going to continue on with the white, tinted white, and this is white tinted with a little bit of cadmium yellow, and I'm adding some of those light white marks going up the side of the house, and notice how much smaller they are. So another tool that you have at your disposal as an artist is called repetition. So you can make big shapes in the front, and you can mimic those big shapes in the front with smaller shapes in the middle ground. And so I've taken the big white shapes of the iris flowers in the foreground, and I've mimicked those shapes in smaller, on a smaller scale in the background. Now remember I said my painting had too many midtones and it was getting to be too light. So now back to the darks. I'm using Burnt Carmine by itself, and I'm just giving some extra accents to the shadows along the path, I also added an extra dark accent to the back left of the path just to sort of draw the viewer's attention there and take away from the dark that's going to be or that is inside the door. I also feel like my painting is a little bit too blue in the foreground so I've mixed up some purple that has more pink in it and I'm adding that to the violet or to the the blue violet of the irises. I'm also finding some other places along the path to put some more purple flowers because it is very green and I think it would be prettier with more flowers. So if you look at the reference photo, there are a few small flowers along the path, but I've made more. I've also made the flowers in the foreground of the path a little bit bigger than the ones in the background. So very tiny, light, delicate strokes that I've added to the background. Now I'm putting more blue on the irises on the right side and I'm putting it on the right side of each flower. So I really want that sunlight to be emphasized. So I've got the yellowish white at the top of the flower on the left, and then a medium blue, and then a deeper blue on the right. When you wanna make something look round, you need to have at least three value shades and temperature shifts to make it look three-dimensional. So you wanna have a yellowish, white in this case, and then a medium light blue, and then a dark blue on the right. I'm adding some shadows to the side of the building. 
I've used a nice violet gray. It's the same gray, or excuse me, the same violet that I used for the flowers, but I added a little bit of yellow to it to make it warmer. Now I'm using burnt carmine again. By the way, if you don't have burnt carmine, you could use Matter Lake and Ultramarine Blue, or Matter Lake and Cobalt Blue, or Alizarin Crimson instead of Matter Lake. Or even quinacridone rose with cobalt blue would work. If you have black and it's ivory black, you could add pyrrole red to it and that would give you a warm dark. A lot of ways to come up with that color. Um, but now you know about burnt carmine, so that's a good thing. So I'm, I'm, a I'm adding some darks here and there to the painting where I kind of just think it needs a little extra dark. So the purpose of adding these darks is to balance out the lights and darks on the painting to emphasize some of the edges that I think need to be emphasized and to push some of the foreground forward. I also added the darks along the path to emphasize the shadows and make a darker edge where the shadow first meets the path, so underneath the, the plants. And I'll go back and forth with this a little bit, lights and darks, and just assess is it making my painting better? One of the things um, that I do when I'm painting is if I make three paint strokes and I feel like they're not making the painting better, I'm just sort of fishing for what's going to work and what's not, and I feel like they're making the painting worse. If I do that three times in a row, then I know it's a cue for me to take a break, go have a cup of tea, uh, go pet my dog, something like that, but to just step away from my painting for a little bit and then come back to it with fresh eyes. And you'd be surprised what a five minute break can do for your vision of where your painting needs to go next. It's an amazing tool. So when you get to the finishing stages of a painting, um, my students are always afraid of the same thing. They're always afraid that their painting is going to look overworked. And that's another reason you should slow down um, because you don't want it to look overworked. But you do want it to look like it has a lot of detail. Even if that detail is loose, you can still have a lot of detail in a painting and the painting can still be loose. But you want to look at your painting and you want to just have a sort of this mental checklist or maybe you want to make a checklist for yourself and put it in your studio somewhere. And you want to look at your painting and you want to first ask yourself, are my values working? Do I have enough lights, mediums, and darks? And are they in the right places in my painting? Are they in the right dimensions? Do I have enough bright colors? And do I have enough grays? And then do I have enough warm and cool temperatures? Is my painting capturing the feeling that I want it to capture? Does it feel like I intention, I, I wanted it to feel when I first started working on it? Does it capture my emotion? If you have emotion for the place that you're painting and so on. And you want to, you want to ask yourself about edges. Do I have enough crisp edges in my foreground? Do I have enough soft edges in my background or in my center of interest? And then you want to make small adjustments one at a time. When I'm working at a, on a big painting, um, a really big painting, I will often just sit in a chair and look at my painting with a piece of paper and a pen and I'll actually write down notes to myself as if I were my own teacher and tell myself what to do and make myself a checklist because once I get started painting again I get into this other space in my head that's not quite as logical and it's a forgetful space in my head where I'll forget what I need to do or I'll forget everything I need to do and I'm also um, very visually distracted so I might go towards my painting thinking okay I need to add some more blue here and then as I'm getting ready to add the blue I'll see another space in my painting that needs attention and I'll forget about the blue and I'll think oh yeah I need to put some red here I'm just making this up but I do definitely get distracted by my own work and that's part of the beauty and wonder of being an artist is being able to look at your painting as a whole and want to address all parts of it, but when you really need to problem solve, it's helpful to understand 
how your mind works and where you get distracted and where you're able to pay attention. And maybe you need to be like me and make a checklist for yourself of what needs to be fixed. And maybe you can't get it all done that day, but you make yourself a checklist and decide, okay, tomorrow when I get to work on my painting again, here's what needs to be addressed. So anyway, just a thought about finishing your painting because I get asked this so much. How do I know when I'm finished? How do I know when I'm finished? And uh, I can't always see your work, so I don't always know. But I'm just continuing to layer and notice how much smaller my brush strokes are and how much smaller my adjustments are. Very tiny bits of light and dark, very tiny bits of bright colors. And each one is having an impact because there is so much paint on the painting at this point. And it I could call it done. I definitely could call it done. But I want to take it further and I want it to be really finished so that when I look at it there isn't anything that looks like it needs to be addressed it looks completely finished like there isn't one more thing I could do to it to make it better so right now I feel like it's pretty balanced my eye is gets getting stuck a little bit on the door frame where the dark um, meets the light and it's distracting me a little bit from the flowers, but I'm visually weighing out um, how to address that. So I could address that by softening the edge of the door, or I could add some more dark and light points on my painting to take the attention away from that door so it isn't the only space in the painting where there's a dark next to a light. So I am adding some extra darks and some extra lights on my path that lead up to the door. I'm also going to add some extra lights to the greenery around the door to sort of spread the light around so that the only light value isn't just the pink salmon color on the side of the door. So I'm going to continue to add a few more lights here and there on the foliage around the house. I feel like that dark on the upper right side is a bit distracting. It's taking my attention away from the door and the flowers. So I'm going to use it as a backdrop to more foliage. I'm going to emphasize the yellow and just make it look even warmer going down the path and really, really inviting. One thing about paintings with light and shadow, it's really nice to have the foreground be in shadow. It gives the viewer the feeling of standing in the shade and looking into the light. So I always say that warmer colors come forward and cooler colors recede. But in the case of a painting like this, where you have a clear path with light and shadow, it's really nice to have that cool shadow in the foreground and the cool blue flowers in the foreground and be looking into the light. And there's still enough warmth in the irises and in the orange flowers and in the yellowish greens to keep the viewer's eye um, feeling like there's a warm foreground but they're still standing in the shade and that's a really beautiful thing. So I just added some dark violets to the iris flowers on the left as a last finishing touch. I hope you enjoyed this painting video and we had a little virtual trip to Monet's home and garden. Thanks for watching. Happy painting!